Coming up this week on Ride the Lightning, the Tesla Motors unofficial podcast, we get our first clue about what kind of performance the Model 3 might be capable of. Details of the next Model S and X firmware update have been leaked, and a Tesla owner is tragically killed in the first autopilot-related fatality. Welcome to episode 48. It's Ride the Lightning, the Tesla Motors unofficial podcast. My name is Ryan McCaffrey for July 3rd, 2016. I want to wish a happy 4th of July to American listeners out there. A happy Canada Day that just passed to Canadian friends. A happy birthday to Elon Musk, who turned 45 this week. And a happy Sunday to everybody else. Unfortunately, the first and big story of the week is one you've no doubt heard about. I've had uh, my friends and family who aren't even you know, big Tesla fans or advocates, you know, either email me or tweet me about this. And that is the unfortunate autopilot tragedy in Florida last month that was just made public this week. May 7th, down in Florida, a 40-year-old Joshua Brown, an ex-Navy SEAL, who has more recently been a Tesla and just overall general EV advocate. He'd been posting, he has a 2015 Model S, he'd been posting videos to YouTube, uh, just a big Tesla fan, uh, you know, real, real advocate of the car and of the company and of, of technology. He was tragically killed in an, uh, in an accident in Florida when, uh, well, I'll spare you the details, but uh, it, it involved a, a tractor trailer, a collision with a, with a tractor trailer, which, uh, which Mr. Brown did not survive. Tesla posted a blog about this saying, quote, we learned yesterday evening uh, that the National Highway uh, Traffic Safety Association is opening a preliminary evaluation into the performance of autopilot during a recent fatal crash that occurred in a Model S. This is the first known fatality in just over 130 million miles where autopilot was activated. Among all vehicles in the U.S., there is a fatality every 94 million miles worldwide. There is a fatality approximately every 60 million miles it is important to emphasize that the NHTCA, TSA action, pardon me, is simply a preliminary evaluation to determine whether the system worked according to expectations. And that is, uh, by all accounts, as this has been pieced together, the, the company uh, in this blog, Tesla, issuing a, you know, their condolences to Mr. Brown's family and his friends, Elon himself taking to Twitter to, uh, to do the same. And, you know, by, by all accounts, Mobileye, the, you know, one of the, cam- the camera provider coming out and saying, you know, that, this, that, that, that their system, the automatic emergency braking system, is, is determined to, uh, is rather de- uh, designed to prevent rear-end collisions, not this sort of crossing as this truck was, was crossing out and the car went, went underneath the tractor. Uh, but this, you know, it, it's a, it's an extremely unfortunate situation. The, uh, the, uh, Mr. Brown was apparently found dead at the scene and, uh, you know, the, in the wake of this, the, so the truck driver claimed that, that Mr. Brown was watching a Harry Potter movie on a portable DVD player. Uh, he, he said he heard the film, but could not see it, which, you know, is a, is a reasonable, uh, thing for him to say when, if you happen to have seen a photograph of of the wreckage, uh, that the top of the car was was shorn off. So it was uh, it's entirely possible that the portable DVD player was was heard but not seen when uh, when when the truck driver got to the scene. And in fact, the Florida Highway Patrol did confirm that they did find a portable DVD player. That doesn't necessarily mean that the truck driver is correct, but it's uh, it's you know corroborate. It's a, it's an indication at this point. It's 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 in the mix as as this investigation is ongoing. Now, uh, now the the Associated Press has been been continuing to report on this. Says quote uh, they're they're mentioning the fact that Mr. Brown's driving record uh, was was hardly spotless saying Brown's driving record obtained by the Associated Press showed he had eight speeding tickets in a six-year span, seven in Ohio, one in Virginia, the most recent ticket in northeastern Ohio in August 2011. So that's, that's nearly five years ago, was for, but was for driving 64 in a 35. Uh, his friends and, and associates claiming he was something of a daredevil, had a need for speed. So, um, you know, not, not a 
that that certainly doesn't absolve autopilot. It doesn't absolve. Uh, it doesn't impl- implicate Mr. Brown. It's it's certainly an unfortunate tragedy all the way around. Uh, the truck driver is a 62 year old gentleman by the name of Frank Baresi. He, it turns out, as this as this has developed, was no saint on the road himself. Uh, noted, uh, or pardon me, according to the Associated Press, federal records don't identify drivers by name, but they showed uh, that the driver was cited for seven violations during four traffic stops over the past two years. So that's uh, also not good, not a good situation here. Now, uh, this is certainly nothing but a, a tragedy that the, the uh, you know, Elon explained a little bit on Twitter and the blog post on Tesla's site as well. Their, their sort of side of it from the autopilot technical side that this tractor, this, this tractor trailer was crossing over into, you know, perpendicularly into Brent, Mr. Brown's path. And it was a bright, sunny day, the light reflecting off of the bright white side of the tractor trailer meant that the the autopilot the camera could not pick it up and thus not uh, apply the uh, emergency braking so uh, and and neither did did the victim so whether he was distracted with a with a movie we don't know or whether he just but the the, the apparently the data su- suggests that the brakes were not applied and so uh so there there is clearly there are a lot of pieces to this a lot of a lot of uh components to it and it you know it's it's a, just a shame for uh you know such a young a young person to be to be taken someone with you know with a family and uh it'd been such a, a an a- an asset to the Tesla community to the EV community he had again I think I mentioned he had a YouTube channel at one point he'd posted a video uh showing the the autopilot actually helping him avoid an accident uh so it's it's really just unfortunate. Uh, the the Tesla community, of course, grieves for for Brown and his family. I actually uh, thought that noted Silicon Valley angel investor, Tesla owner, and Tesla fan, a guy by the name of Jason Kalkanis, said who, who I follow on Twitter. I thought he said it very well in a, in a series of tweets. He said, "Tragic to hear about the death of a Navy SEAL." an EV enthusiast who died in an accident while using the experimental autopilot. However, it's critically important that people use these new features as instructed as they are very clearly experimental and not level four. And of course, by level four, he's referring to the car being able to effectively completely drive and handle itself uh, without any human intervention. Uh, And then he, he went on to say, people are correct that the technology has advanced quickly and is probably already safer than humans, but it's labeled experimental. Uh, it's clear that the technology is saving lives and avoiding many accidents already based on statistics. A very sad situation. Hopefully folks will see the big picture here and keep investing in this life-saving technology, understanding the transformative opportunity. I thought he really, he really said it well there. What I'd like to add, uh, based on everything I've read about this, obviously in preparation for the podcast this week, is it, it, by all accounts, it sounds like this was simply not a good scenario, regardless of autopilot. But, uh, you know, what, it's difficult to say whether this could have been avoided, whether or not his hands were on the wheel, which autopilot does require you to agree that you will do. I've seen it in, in the cars, all of you with Tesla's. Uh, that have autopilot equipped Teslas have seen it as well. Uh, you know, th- th- this this may or may not have have been avoided, regardless of autopilot and regardless of whether or not his hands were on the wheel. And I, and it you know yes, it's it's beta technology. The autopilot is clearly labeled beta, and you of course have to re- agree to a number of restrictions and a number of requirements when you when you activate it in your Tesla. So. In the wake of this, many have raised questions about about whether or not uh, beta software like this that should be allowed in the public's hands. In my opinion, I think it should for two reasons. Number one, if you're not comfortable with it, you can opt out until the release is quote unquote final. You have that option. You do not have to use it if it's if it's beta software running in your car you in this case you are you are not under any obligation 
to run it. And I will say this as well. Number two, the reason I'm in favor of, of not placing any restrictions on autopilot and not, and not um, jumping to any conclusions about the safety of, of beta software like this in driver's hands is that without these millions of miles logged by willing beta participants collectively on a daily basis, that, that blue ocean future of autonomous driving is not going to get here nearly as quickly. It's just not. This is, cert- this is absolutely a tragedy, but it should not be used, in my opinion, as a reason to stop pushing for a safer, this, that's the bottom line here, a safer future for all of us on the world's roads, which is what Autopilot's helping to do. And in fact, Brown's family, the victim's family, said in a statement that it wanted to help the government and help Tesla in this investigation so that, quote, information learned from this tragedy will trigger further innovation, which enhances the safety of everyone on the roadway. Uh, pardon me, everyone on the roadway. So uh, could not agree more with the Browns family there. Uh, putting it, you know, really, that's a, that's a wonderful, them, wonderful thing for them to, to say in, in the face of such a difficult emotional situation. So, uh, you know, the... I don't want to sound cold or callous in any way, shape, or form, but you know this was going to happen somehow, some way, eventually. Beta or not, quite frankly, because there, until the human element is gone, you know the the Tesla autopilot autonomous functionality can be as good, it can be as perfect as Tesla's engineers can get it to be, but the, that technology is never going to be able to properly account for and predict the actions of other human drivers on the road. So it's going to be a long, long time. We're going to see cars get safer and safer uh, over, the, over the next decade or two in particular. But you're, you know, it's not perfect. It's never going to be perfect until every single vehicle on the road is autonomously driven. And we may never get to that point because we as a society may decide we don't want to get to that point. I mean, I can tell you right now, I enjoy driving, as I'm sure many of you listening to this podcast do. Because why else would... I mean, if, if you're listening to this podcast, which is which is one uh, insanely obsessed 35-year-old man <laughs> talking by himself, uh, currently, by the way, in a car in his garage, <laughs> about about all things Tesla every week, odds are you enjoy driving too. You enjoy the, the car itself, the driving experience. It is a pleasurable uh, leisure activity as well as your commuting device. And I, for one, have no desire to give up that privilege, which, which we have in our society. But at the same time, you know, I'm more than happy to have the car drive me to and from work because commuting sucks. I, I love, I always tell people, I, it's like, I love to drive, but I hate to commute. And there's a big difference between those two things. And so, but the point is, you know, I certainly never want to give up the, the option to drive. And I suspect many folks are in the same boat. And, and, and as what the point being that even when all the cars have full autonomous capability decades from now, maybe when my four-year-old is my age or, or older, will, will, the, will you know, the systems ever be even close to perfect because of that human element. But um, it, all we can do is learn from this. And that's what, that's what the family of the victim seems to want. And that's certainly, I'm sure, what Tesla wants. And that's certainly what the government wants as well. So um, again, just condolences to the Brown family. And hopefully we can... Uh, all learn from this and and his death will not be in vain. Uh, I want to in fact go to we've got a bunch of calls this week, most of them reacting to the solar city news from last week as I, I wanted everybody to call in on that and a number of you did so we'll get to that in the ride the lightning hotline section. but I did get a call I'm sure I'm sure there'll be many calls in the hotline uh, for next week's show about this autopilot related fatality because it did happen late in the week. And I I certainly encourage you. I'm happy to, happy to, to hear everybody's thoughts and and play some of those on next week's show. But uh, for right now, let's hear from DJ 
uh, in Ohio who reacts to the autopilot fatality. So, DJ, go ahead. Hey, Ryan. DJ in north central Ohio here calling to weigh in about the unfortunate accident that occurred uh, actually some time ago, but was just reported yesterday. Um, one thing that I think is very important to distinguish here is that what happened had nothing to do with autopilot, actually. And autopilot's getting a lot of flack over this. Um, but what really failed here is the automatic emergency braking system on the car and not autopilot. Um, autopilot's just keeping you in the lane. Uh, it's keeping you away from a car that's in front of you. But when you have a tractor trailer turn in front of you, autopilot is going to do nothing about that, and hopefully your automatic braking system is going to kick in. Uh, but even Mobileye, who makes the autopilot, said that their automatic braking system was never even meant to handle the situation that occurred. It's only supposed to prevent you from rear-ending somebody. So a really unfortunate accident. You know, thoughts and condolences out to, to the man's family that perished. Uh, uh, it's just a really unfortunate situation that uh, Tesla's going to take blame for, and unfortunately, none of it was the technology's fault. It's, it, it laid with the driver. So, unfortunate all around. Keep up the good work. Uh, keep on keeping on. Later. I, I don't disagree with anything you said, DJ. I will say, uh, with regard to Tesla and Autopilot taking flack for this, I actually, I think the knee-jerk was that, was it was initially like, oh, well, this... But, but I actually think it calmed down very quickly when more of the facts started to come out, um, or at least more of the information started to come out. And, you know, Tesla very much got out in front of this. I will say, I, not to look a, look a tragedy uh, the wrong way here, but just from a Tesla perspective, I am surprised that the Tesla stock didn't take a huge hit right after this happened, because that's typically like with the, you know, with the fires, the, you know, four fires that happen, you know, with, with things like this, in incidents similar to this, uh, as far as the bad PR goes, the stock has usually, because it is such a volatile stock, has taken a hit, but that didn't really seem to be the case this time. Tesla did get out in front of it, you know, issuing that statement right after this whole thing went public. And I, and I think, you know, it is pretty clear to anybody who's read the accounts of what happened, that, that this just, as I said, would have been a really bad scenario with or without autopilot. So DJ, thank you for the call. And now I want to move on to the rest of this week's Tesla news, uh, which fortunately is, is a bit cheerier here. The first one is the first of two great scoops by, again, one of my favorite websites covering Tesla, and that's Electrek. Co. That's uh, if you haven't visited there, it's e l e c t r e k electrek. Co. They got us an exclusive on uh, an inside source regarding Model 3's inverter, the drive inverter that uh, basically is is the thing that attaches to the motor. It's it's sort of the conduit that drives the, the more or less the go between. I mean, I'm not maybe I'm not explaining this well enough, but uh, it's basically kind of the the bit between the battery and the motor that gets the power from the battery into the motor, and uh, it's a it's a critical piece of the car. And it seems the Tesla took a clean sheet design for the Model Three, and they are readying a brand new inverter uh, that is that is going to out that twenty five percent fewer unique parts, uh, and they've decreased. Uh, or pardon me, increase the volumetric and gravimetric current density. So let me let me actually read some choice bits from Electric. I encourage you to read the full story over at Electric. It says a source very familiar with the Model 3 powertrain program confirmed the Tesla tapped the same engineers who worked on the dual motor inverter architecture to develop Model 3s, but this time they were given a blank sheet. And according to the source, the strategy paid off and the inverter architecture for the Model 3 will have a capacity of over 300 kilowatts, which is comparable to the Model S's system, even though the S is a much higher end and larger vehicle. Now, what that means uh, is that uh, we can expect, we can reasonably project, I won't say expect quite yet, but this, this sets the table for the Model 3 being able to put up similar performance numbers to the Model S because it's, uh, you know, the the inverter... Because we know the pack isn't going to be as large. They're not going to be... There's almost certainly not going to be a 90 kilowatt hour pack. 
but if it can effectively more more efficiently use if the inverter is more efficient then it's going to be able to get bottom line get more power to the motor and get more power out of the car so i mean i've talked about this before on the podcast uh and this fortunately i'm just glad to see this starting to come true now uh because a lot of people there's been there's plenty of debate on both sides in in the tesla community of well you know the model 3 is not going to have nearly the performance of the Model S because, you know, there's not as much, the batter, the pack's not as big, so it's not going to be able to draw as much juice out to, to pump out through the motor. Uh, or some other, some people think it's purely a sort of a political decision where, well, the S is the flagship, it's the upscale one, so there's no way that the three, you know, the little, the little guy in the lineup is going to have superior performance numbers to the Model S. Some people think it's financial. It's like, well, it's a $35,000 base price car, so there's no way it's going to, even when, you know, optioned up, it's not going to be able to outperform a $120,000 ludicrous Model S. So there, there are a number of, of opinions on this, and I'm not so sure it's going to outperform the S, but I, I believe I've said on the show, and I'll just talk about it again real quick, I do expect the Performance Model 3, which I'm hoping and praying I'll be able to check the boxes and order for myself, not only for the performance factor, the fun factor, but it means I'll, I'd get my car sooner, since, of course, Tesla's going to be building and delivering the higher-spec cars first. But uh, I, my personal guesstimate, just pure guesstimate, is I think the Performance Model 3... Out, forgetting Ludacris for a second, we do know that Ludacris is happening. Elon confirmed that on Twitter, but I think the, the let's call it, just for sake of argument, 75 kilowatt hour pack, because we know it's probably going to be in that range. Let's call it the P75D, just for the sake of argument. I think it's going to come in somewhere, at worst, in the high threes for 0 to 60, and at best in the low threes, you know, 3-1, 3-2, 3-3. With honestly, with the the truth, the reality probably laying somewhere in between. Uh, now, for Ludacris, you know you can shave a few tenths off of that as you do with the uh, Model S, because presumably the Ludacris will do the same thing on the three, which is have the Inconel uh, Smart Fuse that can uh, have a higher draw, have a higher current draw from the from the pack, and that would put. Uh, by my guess, a ludicrous Model 3 in either the very high twos, like you know, 2829, or you know, maybe at worst the mid threes. So all of that would be great. <laughs> as far as I'm, any of that would be great. Um, you know, Elon is not one to hold back. Some people think, oh well, they'll yeah, they'll you know, they're as I said, they're going to they'd artificially limit it, or they'd, they'd hold it back because they wouldn't want to outdo the S. Well, number one, the S is going to continue to evolve as well. But number two, it's just not Elon's way to hold back. His goal, as I've said before, is to make an EV so good that you would buy, you buy it instead of an ICE, not because it's an electric vehicle, but almost in spite of it being electric. It just happens to be an electric vehicle where you buy it because it's such a good car and the benefits are so good. And you go, well, look at the performance. Holy crap. I can, for the same money or less compared to a BMW M3, I can get this Tesla Model 3 that's, you know, outperforms it in a zero to 60 and it's costs exponentially less to operate. So that is Elon's goal. That is what his mission is, has to be and is with the Model 3. So uh, we'll see what happens. But this, this is a great first, you know, concrete, tangible indication that the Model 3 is going to be a force to be reckoned with, at least in the in the eighth of a mile on the drag strip, off the line. So, we'll see. Speaking of Model 3, the silver Model 3 prototype, the very same one I was very, very lucky to ride in at the Model 3 unveil event back on March 31st, it was spotted in front of the factory just hanging out, just literally parked out there. It was clean. It was. It looked immaculate. It was clean, polished to perfection. It looked incredible. It was photographed and put on the internet. And I just there's there's nothing really to say here other than I just love the fact that Tesla doesn't even hide it. Because literally, 
anyone can drive up to the front of the factory. You can't get in, but you can drive up. You can pull in. There's a gate. There's a guard. There's a gate there with a guard, and you can say, "Oh, I'm you know going into the store, or I'm meeting someone, or you know whatever it is you're doing, uh, going to the service center." You can just roll right up and park, and and you can walk outside. You can and and the car was just parked right out front, right outside of the factory. And I, yeah, I just love that they don't even try to hide it. It's not hidden in the back. It's not hidden inside. It's literally parked out front as if they want you to see it. And also, I want to add, if you haven't seen the picture, it is looking gorgeous in the bright sunshine. I am not one for silver cars personally uh, because I just think they're too common that every other car on the road that I see it, that I seem to see anyway, is, is silver. Um, so it's just not, that's not my way. I'm, I'm, I'm not a person that I like to be a little different. Uh, I'm, I like to have the, maybe the, the color that not everybody has, but I still like, but, um, boy, that silver on that model three looks real nice. <laughs> I mean, it looked beautiful in person that night at the model three unveil event. And, in the daytime photographs that we've seen of it ever since, it's been looking really, really good as well. So, uh, in fact, I wonder, I wish I had his name in front of me. I feel bad that I don't now, but the gentleman uh, who made the, you know, just the the fake design studio for Model 3 where he used the that picture up north of the Golden Gate Bridge as his template for, for, his, uh, for his design studio, I wonder if he'll now update it with one of these uh, newer pictures out in front of the factory because boy it is a it is a beautiful beautiful photograph more model 3 news and uh, 12 of you out there in model 3 reservation land who knows if i'll tell you if it's anyone that listens to this podcast please call in because i would love to hear from you 12 model 3 reservation holders have been drawn to get uh, basically golden Wonka tickets <laughs> that will win them, that get them an all expenses paid trip to the Gigafactory grand opening event at the end of this month in uh, Sparks, Nevada, outside of Reno. So uh, I didn't win, but I encourage all of you to check your email, check your spam slash junk folder. You never know, but 12 people out of the couple hundred thousand of us from that first day, which is what this was drawn from, are going to win. Uh, speaking of the factory, by the way, I actually, see, now, I should have done this story before the last one, because the segue would have been much better. This the <laughs> bad host. I'm a bad host. Uh, if you remember, St- uh, Senate Bill 680, California state bill, that would have waived California sales tax for out-of-state customers taking factory delivery of their Teslas here in Fremont, California at the factory. That bill appears to be dead. Remember, it came up uh, one or two shows back where I mentioned, oh, we're still waiting to hear you know, what happens with that. Well, it's, it's bad news, unfortunately, and, and it's thanks, not the bad, it's not, <laughs> the bad thing isn't thanks to Melinda uh, Vermeer, but uh, thank you to listener Melinda Vermeer for sending this update in. She let me know that, uh, quote, it was voted on and approved in the state Senate in January and went to the assembly and sat for some time. Then earlier this month, she's referring to June, actually, because now that it's July, earlier in June, the bill's text in its entirety was deleted and replaced with text regarding state-owned real estate in the city of Santa Clara by a committee in the assembly. So, uh, it's just gone. The The text is literally gone and this is not happening. So it's unfortunate that, and, and again, what this bill means, if you're new or you missed that episode, uh, there was a bill on the table where if you don't live in California, that it would have waived the, cause so what happens is if you, if you live out of California now and you come take delivery of your Tesla in California, you get hit twice you have to pay your state sales tax, but you also have to pay California's sales tax, which is not insignificant. We, you know, everything's expensive here. So this bill was going to waive that for out-of-staters so that you'd only have to pay your home state's income, t- uh, p- pardon me, sales tax. And that would have been great because that, you know, with hundreds of thousands of Teslas 
get, that are going to be pumped out of that factory pretty soon as they, you know, as, as Elon and the team look to, you know, just completely ramp up production on not only the Model 3, but everything. This could have could have brought some tourism money to the state, you know, encouraged more people to come out because, you know, if you you can get the factory tour, if you come out, uh, if you're an owner, basically, if you're an owner, you're allowed to just sign up for one. So a lot of people do take the, the factory tour and when they take factory delivery of the car. Uh, and it's awesome. I mean, it, that's a really cool thing. But the problem is you you had to if you're not a stater, you got to pay qu- quite the tax on that, literally. And sadly, that is going to remain in place for the time being. But there is still more time. So perhaps another bill, including and maintaining that Tesla-relevant language, can get introduced and hopefully passed in the next year or so. Final news story this week is the second Electrek scoop that I promised you earlier in the show. And that is, some, uh, it's a big scoop on firmware 8.0 for you Model S and Model X owners. They're not revealing everything. They specifically said, oh, we're going to, you know, we're not going to tell you everything, but uh, they've they've got it on trusted authority that uh, there's some interesting details that they did share about firmware 8.0. It's going to allow drivers to command autopilot to take an off-ramp exit on the freeway, which is pretty cool, by simply activating the turn signal. So it's going to be able to read that off-ramp and take it now. 8.0 is also introducing a more responsive traffic-aware cruise control and auto steer for a smoother experience in traffic. So it sounds like it's just kind of fine-tuning the functionality that's already there, not so much a new feature. Voice commands are being significantly improved by removing the need to hold the button. Um, I know in my Infinity, which I'm actually literally sitting in now, you just tap it once and it's sort of like a and then it's it's sort of it's like a Star Trek com where you like tap it and it's like ch- the channel's open like captain captain to the bridge. Um, so apparently that's the way the S is and X are going to go now. And then uh, what's also cool as part of that is it's going to show a transcript of what the system thinks you said right on the dashboard. So you'll know right away like that it horribly misinterpreted you or that it that it uh, it understood you properly. And the other thing that they do mention is a, an important refresh of the turn list or actions required and new routing based on energy capacity. The navigation and route planner can now also suggest alternative routes to avoid tolls and use different supercharger locations. So that, that's all cool stuff. Those are, that's all great functionality that's going to be added to the cars, as well as a visual uh, refresh to the UI and, and the thing to remember, if, like me, you're not an SRX owner but a Model 3 reservation holder, all of this stuff, as this continues to get improved upon and iterated upon, is going to be in your Model 3 the day you get it. This is, again, why, you know, the, we, we owe thanks to the S and X owners for continuing to drive these cars and live with them and submit feedback to Tesla and, you know, uh, and new ideas and... and suggested improvements. All these improvements are just going to roll right into the Model 3 the day you get your car. So this is all good news for everybody. That's it for the news this week. Lots to cover. I'm going to come right back again. uh, I've got a handful of reactions to the proposed Solar City deal from last week, as well as a couple of other calls right after this. It's that time of the show for the Ride the Lightning Hotline, where you can call in and leave a message anytime, day or night. You can call, you can Skype. It's a toll-free number. You just leave the voicemail at 1-888-989-8752. Again, that's 1-888-989-TSLA. And I, of course, remind you that if you know someone special with an upcoming birthday, anniversary, graduation, or some other special occasion, you can give them a unique gift of recorded voices from friends and family telling them why they're special. The recordings can be podcasted or put onto a keepsake. Please visit lifeonrecord.com to learn more. Again, uh, plenty of calls to get to this week. Some of you are going to go into the first monthly Patreon call-in show, which, by the way, I'm going to take, because there are so many more $10 
uh, pledges than, than 20 or higher, I actually want to switch things. I'll probably just do this next week where uh, I'll do the reading your name at the end of the show as a $20 thing and the $20 and up thing and the, uh, the bonus show here, the, the all call-in show will be for the $10 tier. I think I'm going to flip those. I think that'll be hopefully better for everybody. More people will get to hear the extra show um, and there won't be quite the long wall of names at the end of the show. So hopefully that'll be, that'll work out for everybody. Let's start off with just, uh, I just want to rattle off a, let's see, one, two, three, four excellent callers, uh, in regards to the proposed solar city buyout, uh, because, uh, they're just good, different perspectives on it that are, they're different perspectives than mine. So first let's go to BJ in Denver. Go ahead. Hey, Ryan, it's uh, BJ from Denver, Colorado. I uh, love the show. Um, been listening since right before the Model 3 reveal. Uh, I wanted to call in and talk about the uh, proposal to buy Solar City. Um, I'm a huge Tesla supporter, but I really don't like this deal. Um, the thing that bugs me the most about it is the... Um, they just did the, the capital raise a couple months ago, and it just kind of, I liken it to, you know, my aunt or something coming to borrow money to uh, help pay the bills. And, uh, you know, so I, I lend her the money, and then uh, all of a sudden I go and visit her house, and she's got a, a brand new 4K TV and, a, uh, and an Xbox One, you know, sitting there. Um, it just seems kind of kind of weird on the timing. Um, and I just think that, uh, it could be done a, a better way. Um, so, or, you know, possibly later. So, uh, like I said, enjoy the show and, uh, keep up with the good work. Thanks. Thank you, BJ. Next up is an anonymous caller from down in Florida. He is not, uh, bothered by it. So let's hear what he has to say. Go ahead. Hey, Ryan, uh, Florida caller here hey, about the, uh, solar city Tesla, uh, merger, if you will. I don't see that uh, changing much a whole lot. Uh, the two separate companies to totally independent staffing. Uh, if anything, it's just going to be a merger of management. You know, Musk is on both boards. Strobel is on both boards. So if they, like, if anything, it's just a merger of management in, in the uh, at least in the uh, starting phase. That's my opinion. Uh, as far as some synergies between the two companies, uh, Tesla pretty much makes inverters for the cars. You know, a fun fact is uh, my last travel at about anywhere from 10 to 15 mile an hour, set on load and motor choice, drive unit, tire wheel size. It's uh, 10 to 15 miles an hour is about 60 hertz. You know, if you do the math, you got a four pole, three phase motor. Um, as far as the uh, Model 3 uh, size, you know, per the uh, motor trend uh, estimations, I think the uh, Model 3 is about uh, three and a half inches shorter, the wheelbase, you know, shorter than the uh, Model S. So even if it's about a foot shorter in overall length, the, the, the car length, the actual wheelbase is only three and a half inches shorter. So it, it's, it's relatively close to the Model S and Model S being a pretty sizable car. Um, and one more point about the uh, autopilot. Uh, even if you're not paying for the full-on uh, autopilot, I think, uh, in my opinion, you're you're still essentially a product. You're not buying into the product because uh, even if you're not if you even if you don't have it active, you know Tesla still uses the hardware to to basically gather data to you know make their overall system better. So even if you're not buying into the product per se, you're still they're still reaping you know full benefit if you know if you get what I'm saying. Anyway, great great show. Uh, I look forward to, to listening to the rest of them. Thanks. He slipped in a couple of other uh, non Solar City things in there as well, but I'll just uh, let them be. And while we're while we're on the Solar City topic, so again, just hearing more perspectives. This one from our friend Avi over in Las Vegas. He this one hits particularly close to home for him because of uh, Nevada's recent solar uh, battle with their with their local power company. So Vi, go ahead. Hey Ryan, it's Vi from Las Vegas calling in again. Uh, I just wanted. To- touch base on the potential purchase of solar city um like i said i live in las vegas and i 
was lucky enough to be able to purchase my home in October of last year, and I opted for Solar City, and because of what was going on in Las Vegas with Solar City, right around that time, they put a hold on my order, and they ended up laying off 500 employees and things like that. And personally, I'm hoping that Elon coming in and being part of it with the relationship he has with the state, with Tesla and the Gigafactory up north, that something will come of this. And everyone living in Las Vegas and the state would be able to get back on track and being able to have solar if they choose to. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, just kind of fingers crossed on that because it's it's pretty bad right now. If if you want to go solar, it it costs you more to go solar than just to pay to live on the grid itself. So uh, fingers crossed, man. Bye. And finally, uh, Walter from Vancouver Island, Canada, has a couple of what I think are very good points about the Solar City situation as well. Walter, you're on the air. Hello, Ryan. This is uh, Walter from Vancouver Island, Canada, uh, long-time listener and uh, Twitter commenter. A um, couple of points from your last show, uh, your discussion on Tesla's purchasing of Solar City. There's a couple of aspects to this that uh, not too many uh, news articles have pointed out, but um, in order to sell electricity, uh, you have to be a power corporation and Tesla at the moment is not a power corporation and they as a result they cannot sell electricity uh, by supercharger so if they plan to sell electricity in the future to Model 3 owners they need to have uh, the ability to distribute power as a power corporation and Solar City holds uh, that privilege in most states uh, presently and Tesla does not so um, that to me, this is one of the no brainers to owning solar city. Uh, the other aspect of it is Tesla will be, um, distributing the power and selling it wholesale from all the house tops and rooftops of these businesses and homes of people who have signed contracts with solar city, uh, direct to, uh, vehicles across the nation. And they'll be able to say that the energy they're selling is 100% solar powered um from the sun love this is the show hope uh this message wasn't too long thank you very much bye oh pardon me one more one more good one from our friend lawton in chicago he's the last one on the solar city topic so uh lawton take it away hi ryan it's lawton again from chicago want to chime in on tesla's bid for solar city i share concerns that tesla may be stretching itself thin by ramping up mouth production so quickly while expanding service centers, stores, and supercharger locations, plus trying to acquire Solar City. However, with great risk comes great opportunity. If they're updating and building new stores, plus have a new influx of Tesla owners, I agree with Elon that now is the time to bundle services and products. Many Tesla owners are interested in sustainable energy, making solar slowing panels a perfect fit. From the investor perspective, they typically want the trio of growth potential, profits, and minimal risk. So understandably, they're concerned about solar city's lack of profit and the increased risk. If the solar city purchase is successful, Tesla may have to change their, their model to the number one goal of Tesla is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable transport and energy. Thanks for all your great work and look forward to hearing your, your thoughts. All right. So great thoughts from everybody there. So most of you seemed uh, a lot less bothered by it than I was, which again, I appreciate the different opinions on this. In fact, uh, Bloomberg put up a piece that Elon tweeted out that really kind of made a, a good case for it. I still, again, I, you know, I, I know it's a good thing in the long run, but I'm just worried that it's going to detract from, as I said in detail last week, detract from the focus on what I think should be the primary mission right now, which is getting the Model 3 done on time and done well and done in a reliable way where we don't see any repeat of, of uh, you know, the Model X uh, build issue situation. So uh, I really appreciate everybody's feedback on that. 
So now let's move on to a couple of other topics. First up, Carlos from Austin has, this is going to be the end of this conversation, but one last clarifying point. You know, we've been talking for a few weeks now with uh, the initial call and then my response and a couple of follow-up calls about the uh, the tax break that's that's good for this year, 2016, the tax credit for uh, installing a, an EV charging situation in a solution in your in your home on your property so we we've heard about the uh you know the tax break and whether you have to have the car there or not that year and here's one last thing carlos has has done some research on this looked into this so i want to give him the floor one more time and we'll put this topic to bed so carlos from austin you're on the air hey there ryan this is carlos from austin texas uh i actually called last month to let you and your listeners know about the IRS tax credit form 8911 for installing a EV charging station in your property. And I think uh, the episode before last, you had someone call in and uh, inform people that uh, you could only claim the tax credit if you had an EV vehicle. Um, I wanted to follow up on that. So I will preface this by saying I am not a tax professional. Um, However, I've done considerable research into this and I've spoken to other people as well. Um, if you look at the IRS form 8911, specifically says that the property has to be placed in service during your tax year. So if you look up the term placed in service, that has a very specific meaning. According to, um, <clears throat> uh, according to Section 179 of the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR, the term placed in service means the time that property is first placed by the taxpayer in a condition or state of readiness and availability for a specifically assigned function. So essentially what that means is a long story short, a tax credit can be claimed in the year that the EV station was installed and made ready for use. It is not tied to whether or not you actually use the EV station or own an EV vehicle. It's only the year that the EV station was installed and made ready for use. So again, I encourage your listeners to, to follow up with their uh, their own, you know, uh, accountant or tax representative just to double check. But from my own reading and from speaking to other people as well, the EV station can simply be installed and made ready for use. It does not have to actually be used or tied to an EV vehicle. So thank you so much, and you have a great podcast. I uh, appreciate all you do. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Well, there you go. Thank you, Carlos. And and as Carlos says, definitely check with a tax professional to be 100% sure. But Carlos has clearly done the research and appears to have their official, the IRS's official definition there. Plus, I mean, as I think I said last week or the week before, I would think that the odds of the IRS actually auditing you or coming after you about that would be pretty slim. But (laughs) not that I'm suggesting you throw caution to the wind. Uh, again, check with somebody, a professional, to be 100% sure. Uh, but uh, but there you go. So, um, again, this this is what's cool. We can get a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different information from, from different folks in the audience. Uh, last call this week goes to, uh, once again, in fact, DJ from North Carolina. Uh, no, sorry, that was, we had BJ from Denver at the top. Now, DJ from North Central. Oh no, we did hear from D. That's right. He was the he was the autopilot caller at the front. I, my memory was correct. So DJ once again, who uh, follows up on a point from uh, from a caller last week, who who we were talking about his his forty five thousand dollar budget for his Model Three. DJ wants to make a couple of excellent points to remember. Just things you got to keep in mind there as well. So DJ, take it away. Hey Ryan, DJ from lovely North Central Ohio again. Hey, just wanted to call and comment about the guy that had the the limit of forty five thousand dollars for his Model Three. Um, and you were talking about the options that you might uh, select. One thing you got to remember, and you kind of alluded to it to it earlier in the episode, uh, you got to figure in that uh, dock and destination fee, and you need to figure in taxes. Um, so his ten thousand dollars for options might be something more like seven or sixty five hundred seven thousand or sixty five hundred dollars. So he really needs to keep that in mind uh, when he when he's going to price out his options. So thanks for the podcast. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Excellent point, DJ. Unless I say with a smile, unless you live in a state with no sales tax, which is only four states. I, I did that. Look that up. 
Oregon, Montana, New Hampshire, and Delaware. I only knew one of those. Oregon was the only one I, I knew off the top of my head. I'm glad I looked up the rest, but those four states don't have any sales tax, FYI. Good stuff, everybody. Again, uh, please call in to the Ride the Lightning hotline because whether I, I might play it on the air or I might play it on the Patreon-exclusive uh, call-in show that happens once a month, the bonus show, the fifth show of every month. So that number, again, which you can call or Skype toll-free anytime, day or night, is 1-888-989-8752. And I'll be back right after this to wrap things up. A couple of last points for you. All right, that brings us to the end of another episode of the unofficial Tesla Motors podcast. I would be extremely grateful if you enjoy the podcast. Please take a look at my Patreon page, which I've got set up there. Uh, You know, again, a lot of work, a lot of hours go into making this podcast every week. I love doing it, but if you do uh, get something out of it, I'd uh, appreciate if you'd consider a pledge of any amount. Anything and everything helps. It's all going into my Model 3 fund to try and to try and get that Model 3 that make that dream of mine come true. So the website is patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. And uh, one of the last, in fact, uh, what, the penultimate reminder that the Tesla referral program is still going. So if you are very, very ready to pull the trigger on an S or an X, there, here's a referral code I'm going to give you right now that will get you $1,000 off of your purchase. Type this into your web browser. It's ts.la slash peter6387. That's peter, P-E-T-E-R, 6387. You've got to act quickly because the referral program ends on July 15th. It's uh, our old friend Peter Kiersgaard stepped forward and once again offered his referral code after we filled up Joe Willits, because you guys are awesome, and everybody used, or five of you used Joe Willits' code. So he's all maxed out. Peter has offered his. And again, you get $1,000 off. Peter gets prizes starting at the second referral. So we've got the one for Peter's. Would love to get him at least one more before this thing ends so he can get that exclusive owner's jacket. Get, give him something for, for his generosity of volunteering his code. And I get, through the generosity of Peter and Joe Willett, I get uh, their, their entries into the raffle. Those referrals all get entries for the owner into the raffle for a Model X, which, uh, which I would very much love to have. It would, it, would make, it would make that dream come true. It would just change everything for me. So, again, if you're buying a Tesla, grab that referral code and uh, enjoy that $1,000 off the car. Follow me on Twitter at DMC underscore Ryan or email me teslapodcast at gmail.com. You can find me on IGN.com each and every day, Monday through Friday and during uh, normal business hours <laughs> as, far as, as far as what I'm up to at work. But of course, it's a website. You can go on there anytime you want and see anything you want. Uh, Dave T, we love his weekly newsletter. Subscribe to that for free at teslaweekly.com, and every Friday morning, Dave will deliver you an awesome newsletter rounding up the week's Tesla news. teslarati.com, Gene and the crew there are fantastic in covering the world of Tesla. They're very, very kind to uh, help promote and get the word out about this podcast. Really appreciate that each and every week. I'm not sure how you guys listen. Most of you probably subscribe somehow, but uh, you can listen or subscribe on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, or teslapodcast.libsyn.com. And that'll do it. That brings us to our Patreon producer thanks, which, like I said, I think I'm going to just flip this for next week so that more people can hear the bonus show. But our Patreon producer, special thanks to Jeff Bartram, Wolfgang Obergen, David Brander, Andrew Evans, Greg Miller, Anthony Coleman, Mac Harris, Ralph Weiss, Mick Nelson, Robert Baptista, Chris Bayall, Magnus Mostrom, Mike Ryleford, Jason Trimble, Andrew Valderas, Greg Canessa, Nick Hoffman, Adrian Alston, Chance Carter, John Wendell, Chris Oakley, Lawton from Chicago, Jason Dignard, Will Caldwell, John Lee Clare, DJ, and this last gentleman, a recent Patreon pledge. I, he's the, this is the one I'm afraid I'm going to get his name wrong. I'm not 100% here. George, please correct me if I'm wrong. George, 
uh, Cacciopo. It's C A C C I O P O. So I believe it's uh, it's the it's sort of Italian style pronunciation. I think George Cacciopo. I hope I've got that correct. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, just can't thank all of you enough for supporting the podcast, supporting the Patreon, and uh, pledging to help me. You know, just help me uh, make you know make my uh, time worthwhile here uh, and, and help me get closer to that Tesla dream coming true. So thanks to all of you. I'll see you all again uh, for, let's see, what is this? Was episode 48, 70, 40, almost episode 50. I love it. That's great. Thank you guys so much. Happy electric motoring, and I'll see you all next week.